too bad at all. Whatever you plan, enjoy your weekend. You too, Matt. Thank you. It's not too bad. Absolutely not. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, Tina Turner. She is one of the most extraordinary yeah. rock stars, isn't she? Her, her private life, life with all that uh, upheaval, domestic it's violence, yeah. uh, for all those years. And it feels like we don't often actually hear from her. No, even though she's got that amazing voice, we don't hear from her like sitting yeah. opposite in an interview situation. Um, she's got a new autobiography, so she's been talking to our arts editor, Will Gompertz, and some interesting stuff's come out. Take a listen. Tina, you taught Mick Jagger the pony. Can you teach me? I'll try. Okay. It's, it's tricky because you go one, two, three. One, two. Now move. One, two, three. One, two, three. The two, your second foot. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> well, count. I can't count. Let's do this again. Okay. <laughs> you can't count. <laughs> Another autobiography. Another. This one is the end of the second part. Yeah. Why? What, what did you want to say? A lot has happened since the stage life and my life changed. And that's how the book starts. So this beautiful wedding starts actually in this hotel and you go back to your house and Lake Zurich, not far from here. And then a series of revelations happen. You feel a bit weird on your wedding day, a bit tired, and you were 73 at the time. And then you had a stroke. Then it was a stroke that came. Immediately they took me in and say, a little, it's a mild stroke from the back of the head. And then they took me down the room and I didn't believe it. I saw a stroke of the head. Like that. They left the room. Plop, hit the floor. The whole right side was gone. And I thought, what have I done? I really have had something because I can't move. Then I had to force, will myself to walk, to make the, to make the leg walk. You know, I thought I was the ultimate person to fix things. And did it affect your, your, your singing at all? No, I think I can still sing. Sometimes I feel something on that side. You might notice the face is a bit fuller. On that side is where it, it affected mostly this side. Uh -huh. So the face became bigger, the handwriting. I corrected all of that. So. With a little makeup, you know, notice the face change. Right. You're supposed to say yes, Tina, you're right. <laughs> you don't. You look fantastic. What can I tell you? You have a stroke, and then? The, the colon. Yeah. So they said, okay, we'll have to cut half of it out. So and you, because it was cancerous. Yeah. yeah. So then they, they said, um, only one of your kidneys are functioning. Actually, what happened was I stopped medication for kidney because I was tired of the medicine and I wanted to see what I felt like, my old self. So I went to the doctor and he said, your kidney numbers, they are totally down. What have you done? I said, well, I stopped the, med stopped the medicine. He said, if you don't do what we recommend, you will probably die. Reverend found out that he doesn't need two kidneys, so then he came to me and said, Tina, you don't have to make this decision now. I, I can give you one of my kidneys. I said, oh, Reverend, you're young. I'm already older. It's okay. You just get used to me not being here. Oh, no, he didn't want that. And he said, no, 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 my life is fine how it is. I'll give you one of my kidneys. And so. say in the book in 1968 you tried to take your own life right at that time when I tried to commit suicide my life was really down mm -hmm. that was the I can Tina days <laughs> violence was every day every moment I did try to leave a couple of times that wasn't written in the books and the first time was when I had the experience of being whipped with a wire hanger he treated me like I was a prisoner and he was the guard. There is a tragic end to the book. It tells the awful story, really, of your, of your son's suicide. Yes. Uh, everything was going good for Craig. 
I have no idea what pulled him down except something that followed him with loneliness. When I was a little girl, I had a red dog. Phil Spector, David Bowie, Mick Jagger. Of all those creative relationships you enjoyed, which were successful, which one was most important to you? Phil, I think Phil, Phil Spector. Spector, I think so. He wanted me to sing, not deliver. I had me singing more of a gospel way. When I was a little girl, I had a rag dog. The melody of that song was, when I was a little girl, when I was a little girl, I had a rag dog. And the production of, the real production of that song was what Phil won. The room was full of all kinds of musicians, that wall of sound. The of famous wall of sound. That famous wall of sound. How you get that is with uh, the instruments here and another kind of instrument and four or five instruments. The room was full of an orchestra. And when that, I chill now. I made it worse. It was another feeling to sing to that. When I was a little you know, really to sing into that, you know, you know, all of, I saw exactly what Phil was producing. 79 next month. How are you, Tina? I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. I'm happier than I ever thought that life would become for me. I did fall a couple of days ago and broke something, so I was in the wheelchair and on crutches. But, but now I'm going through my sick period. And I think that'll take me right into the 90s or whatever. I'll be around for a while. <laughs> Our guest right now is Paul Rose, who's coming to talk to us about the Lake District and new series we've got. Well, you have a connection with Tina Turner. Yes, I do. I ran Traveling Medicine Light Show back at the end of the 60s, and we did the lights at the King's Head in Romford for Ike and Tina Turner. Uh, I, I would never have known how to make a link between the Lake District and Tina Turner with you, but you did it for us seamless. <laughs> Can you believe it? Those are the rock and roll years, I'm yeah, assuming. Yeah, it was, yeah, the King's Head Romford. And now it's all calmed down a little bit, because now you're romping in the Lake District. Yes, I am. What a lucky man. I live up there. You, yeah. And it's I'm, a dream job, this, and isn't I'm it? often coming back from dream places, coming back from Antarctica, you know, Greenland, the deep ocean. I come back to the Lake District and I feel terrific to be there. It's my home. And I really mean that. It really feels like me there. And yet I often find my next BBC project takes me away from home. This one, I could work out of my front door and it felt wonderful. Well, what stories have you got to tell about the Lake District? I mean, I love the Lake District, don't get me wrong, but it yeah. doesn't feel like it's new in the sense of what we have to learn about it and that's what your program's about. I felt about the same because I thought I knew everything about Lake District. Uh -huh. I must be some sort of expert. But in making a television program, I learned loads. Every time I left the house, I learned something new. I had no idea, for instance, that it was so hard to do Cumbrian wrestling. I thought I was going to win, but they're monsters. What's Cumbrian wrestling? Cumbrian wrestling is an ancient form of wrestling that they do at the county shows. And I'd always seen it and thought it was a piece of cake. I thought, come on. Personal I person. could win that, yeah, and I lost terribly. I had no idea of, that you can have a busy tourism industry that does well in the honeypot regions, you know, you know, Bowness, Ambleside, Keswick, and yet our untouched wilderness is so beautifully untouched. Yeah, I learned so much about the hound trailing, the history. I fell in love with a vulture, which I thought would never happen. We've got the we've got this beautiful place, Muncaster, on the west coast, and I thought it was a bit of a you know just an old castle, but they turn out to do beautiful conservation work with birds. Funny enough with a, uh, the world's most beautiful vulture, his name's Moriarty, and we now sponsor him and my partner Joe will keep him going for the rest of his life. Well I tell you what, we're seeing some of the shots of, of, uh, that you filmed and it, you know, there's no escaping the drama of some of those spaces. Do you get great sort of, so we, we talk to a lot of people where they get their kind of solace from, and where, have, where have they had those moments? Does that work for you, being somewhere like that? It, it does, Charlie, because when I'm at work in the wild places, I have to be on the ball all the time, 24 hours a day for weeks or maybe months at a time. When I get home to the Lake District, it has that wonderful sense of wildness and remoteness, and yet it's very, very accessible. So I can go for a walk with no map and compass, no real thoughts of where I'm going to go. I know I'm going to end up at a great pub at the end of the day, maybe in a completely different valley than I first expected, so I can turn off 
and just move close to nature. It's the most wonderful thing. It sounds lovely. It's inspired me to go and take a walk, actually. Thank you, Paul, for coming <laughs> in and talking to us. Um, you can watch The Lakes with Paul Rose tonight on BBC Two at 8.30.